Hey guys, Eric Coffey out here at scorecontracts.com. We're streaming live from Maya West, Puerto Rico. Welcome to today's live stream. We're going to be doing a Q&A session. I'm going to be going through about 13 questions um, from some of my subscribers, again, from their emails that have been sent, some of the comments on YouTube, and things of that nature. Um, I'm already getting some questions in the live chat session, uh, so we're going to go ahead and answer that. But as always, we'll give people a couple minutes to get on, and if you're here, um, let me know you're here and say, hey, give me a shout out. Hola, I see you. Jose Martinez, I see you out there. All right, let's, um, so let's give people a couple minutes to get in right now. Today, like I said, live GovCon training, day number six, Puerto Rico session. Um, you, could, you guys can go ahead and start, you know, firing array, asking questions. Uh, Corbin, I see you in there. Uh, so go ahead and, you know, let's, let's get some questions going. I'm going to go ahead and, and run the intro slide and then we'll get started. All right, so we're back. Um, all right, so the first question that we have coming in to Flame, you're in the house. Welcome. Glad you're in the building. All right, first question, Jazzy said she um, was asking, was Matox only limited to construction? Now, that I'm not really sure about, but I do know that there are IDIQs out there for every particular industry. Matox may be limited to construction, but uh, if you look at IDIQs, which are the are indefinite delivery, indefinite quantity type contracts. They have, like I said, they have uh, the GSA uh, BMO, which I know for a fact is, uh, it, it covers janitorial cleaning supplies. It covers uh, maintenance, building maintenance and things like that. There's also SATOX. There's several of them out there uh, besides just the MATOC. So if you're, if you're NAX code, you're looking for more, I think you have to be looking for IDIQ as opposed to just MATOC. Don't limit yourself to MATOC. Um, so you want to make sure you're looking at IDIQs. So don't focus specifically on Matox. Look at IDIQs. All right. Chill so Welcome, fam. Let's see. Hold on. Let me go back and see what that was. Okay. After research IDIQ, only focus on Matox. Right. Correct. Yeah, Jazzy. Foc yeah, work on researching the IDIQs as opposed to focusing on Matox because there are... Last time I checked, there were probably 700 IDIQs out there, uh, ac active today, and again, they come in all shapes and sizes and all colors, so the, the IDIQs is what you need to be focusing on when you're looking for multiple year contracts, not just Matox. All right, Blah, you have some questions? Talk to me. I'm listening. All right, Jazzy, I also called USAD to find out about doing a project in Belize, and they directed me to Ostabu. I have a telephone number in Walmart. Perfect. Yeah, that's what I talk about in the GovCon Giants course, folks, is... You know, reach out and call them, and if you, especially if you call Washington, if you go ahead and give these people a call, they'll send you to the right person that you need to talk to. So, you know, call them up, and then they'll direct you to OSPU, which, by the way, uh, Zara, welcome. Glad you're here. To, glad you could join us tonight. So, by the way, uh, if you go through that OSPU, and if you've already been through my course, I talked to you about going through the OSPU small business specialist and things like that. Lysandra Barnett, welcome. Um, Louis, I see you, brother. And so, yeah, if you go through the Ostabu, then they'll will, you can have a sit down session. Remember, by the way, Jazzy, if you're going to meet with that Ostabu, have some projects in mind that you, you know what I'm saying, that you're already looking at. Go through and have your forecast list ready for them. So have some projects in mind that you want to present, you know. Um, so make sure before you call them, have some projects already in mind that you want to do that you're interested in because if they ask you a question you don't want to be caught off guard so I'm not I'm not saying don't pick up the phone and call them tomorrow but just make sure you have something in mind Blas question is do the feds pay uh, before net 30 yeah a lot of times on construction projects we get paid uh, net 15 net 30 is only when we're actually closing out the job at the end of the day but we get paid net 15 terms on the most of our construction projects hey y'all welcome sorry green all right Charles and <laughs> when am I going to put up that consultant video? Uh, actually, yeah, Charles, I was supposed to put that video out already. I um, I had to, to leave out really quickly and come over here and help uh, do some work in Puerto Rico. We're doing, uh, we're helping the people with disaster relief. And so uh, I have the video. It's completed. Give me, um, probably next week I'll put it out. But I do have three more videos loaded that I'm going to release this week. That uh, there'll be some good stuff to get you guys going. All right. Uh, Gala Hogan, hey, how's it going? Welcome to you, Flame. Edson Rodriguez. All right, perfect. Thank you for joining us tonight, Edson. 
appreciate it. Um, I'm starting from scratch. I do have an LLC for at least a year before I can do contracts. Um, I'm on day eight. You love GovCon training. Perfect. Two flame. I hope you're learning a lot today. All right. What's the difference between GSA schedule and open market in layman's terms? This is a response to procurement source request within a solicitation. So if you guys don't know already, GSA schedule um, is where it's like a, a book that the government has where they can buy stuff directly from you. And so you have to pre-qualify to get on the GSA schedule. It's a lot of paperwork. It's pretty cumbersome. But you essentially, you establish the price terms for the product or service that you want to deliver to government up front. And let's say it's, it's, it's more for like commodity type items. So anything that you can commoditize, that's what you would actually put. Um, that was, that's what goes into a GSA schedule. And you can you can actually go on to the GSA services website and see a list of all the available schedules. And then at the same time, you'll find a list of all the companies that are on GSA schedules. So in layman's terms, what it is, is it's essentially like um, a catalog that the government uses where if they need to buy something really fast, let's say a computer, let's say a mouse or a keyboard, they can go on there and they can order that item directly because the pricing is already established. And so that's essentially, uh, in layman's terms, the best way to describe a GSA schedule. Now, the, the second question you probably have is, how do I get on a GSA schedule? Well, to get on a GSA schedule, there's an application process that you go through. And like I said, there's terms that you have to establish. There's pricing that you have to establish. And then you have to be able to meet certain delivery um, metrics out there. So for example, depending on the type of item or product that you're providing to the government, they may want it delivered within 24 hours. They may want it uh, delivered to a certain location. And so again, it's it's geared towards commoditized items, meaning so something that you, like you said, if you know that you buy uh, this specific mouse at $10 and you can sell it to the government for $12, then you can put that into a GSA schedule, right? And it's the same thing, again, computers or devices, remote controls, fans, anything like that, that, that again, like I said, that you can buy, you know, water. These items are all GSA schedule items. Hey, Raymond, welcome today. I see uh, we've got about 18 people watching right now. Um, make sure you say hi. Give me a shout out. So it looks like we're already at the 17-minute uh, mark. By the way, like I said, today I didn't prepare a lesson. I didn't even know if I was going to have internet. We're here in Puerto Rico. I'm doing some volunteer work, helping out um, with everyone here, trying to help some of the disaster relief. It's funny because we actually ran into FEMA today, and I ran into some other government officials that were dressed up. And, um, you know, they were, they were actually here helping to do assessments for some of the damaged homes and things like that. So, yeah, it was actually interesting. I'm, I'm, my plans are to meet with and talk with some of the agencies, well, specifically FEMA, but talk to some of the procurement officers about what's available out here in the region uh, after we finished, you know, the first seven days of doing our um, work here on the ground with the people. All right, Blah has a question. What do I submit for a pre-solicitation? I've sourced the items I want to respond. The solicitation state they also want the quotes. Is there a standard format? Now, uh, if you have... If, if the government's asking for quotes uh, on a pre-solicitation, they, they already have a format that they want, that they're providing, so you just have to, to respond in the format that they give. The only other thing that I could think that you're, you're asking, by the way, the question was, what do I submit for a pre-solicitation? I have sourced the items and I want to respond. The solicitation stated they also wanted the quotes. Is there a standard format? So, again, if you're, if you're responding to a pre-solicitation, the government already has the format that you're going to use and follow. And so that's really, that's nothing that you can change or modify. Uh, in terms of the the only thing that I could think of that you're questioning about is maybe the written pro proposal that you, you have to explain to the government how your plans on delivering it, providing it, making sure it meets quality standards, which are health and safety plan. That's the only other thing I could think of. Um, but what I would say, uh, I do have formats that I follow, but what I would say is, is make sure you you follow in the order that they outline the steps of the documentation. So just follow that order that they've given you. So if they say, in fact, what I'll do for you, blah, I have a video on that. I'm gonna, I'll, I will release it tomorrow. Um, it's a video that I help walk through some people on a pre-solicitation on a contract, and I'll release that for you guys tomorrow. Yeah, right. Exactly for the proposal part. Ex yeah, that's what I figured you're talking about, not the actual uh, the actual uh, solicitation. Yeah. So what I'll do. Um, I have it already, and it's already uploaded to YouTube. All I got to do is take it from uh, offline to online, and you guys can have access to it. So what I'll do is tomorrow, 
I'll go ahead and I'll put that out. By the way, make sure, blah, are you on my, uh, are you on my email list? Make sure you're on my email list because what I'll do, I'll shoot out an email to everybody and let them know it's coming out. I'll kind of explain and run through what the video's about. It's a really good video. Uh, chill, so, what's going on, brother? Will you let us know if they have some kind of opportunities for us, uh, your mentees in the group? Yeah, well, like I said, I, uh, it's funny, Jazzy, you asked that. Okay, great, blah. Glad you're on the email list. Yeah, because I'll shoot out an email when that when I release that video as well to the group. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I mean, essentially, I'm going to talk to here. I'm here on the ground. This is the same thing that I tell you guys to do. you got to come out there. you got to talk to the people. you got to meet the contracting officers. you got to meet the small business specialists. you got to put yourself out there in order to, you know, get these contracts. It doesn't just come to you. It doesn't appear. You know, the stuff that I'm going on, and, in fact, if you watch my thanksgiving clip you saw where i showed you i demonstrate there was a, a bid that was awarded to a company berger or something like that that was 860 million here in puerto rico and there was another bid that was awarded for like 7 million to a company m m contracting in puerto rico so i mean the opportunities are here they're everywhere um but yeah if if i mean if there's anything available um then you know i will i'll definitely let you know but i can tell you this you know my goal my focus is going to be if i can help some of the the local people here get a part of this contracts that's going to be my primary focus only because i you know i know that there's they have the same issues that we had in florida the same issues that you have in texas the same issues people had in new orleans and and where there's fires is that you know most of us are working in our local towns and cities and we hate when other people come into your area and they they they're getting the contract opportunities so most of the people they don't really they don't like that and so for me my first priority would be working with the local people here in Puerto Rico to help them get some of the contracts because I'm sure there are great local contractors here that do painting, that do construction, that do all these types of services. And so my objective would be to help them first. Um, you know, that would be my first primary objective because, uh, what you know, I'm, they may or may not be able to qualify for a, you know, a $10 million procurement opportunity. But if we were to, you know, put it in, in, in a company name and we manage and oversee the project, then we could help you know, get, get, hand out and, and be responsible for ensuring that the work gets done down here in the region. All right. To you, Flame has a comment. I'm learning a lot. You make this where a seventh grader can understand. Thanks to, I, I appreciate that because like I said, this is a lot of work for me. Uh, I put a lot of effort into these videos and this training. Uh, I have to constantly be updating this information. So I really appreciate that. And then, like I said, I've got some stuff coming up for you guys this week that I'm going to release um, you know, on data time. I know it's a lot of content, it's a lot of information, uh, but I'm working on that. The other thing that I'm working on is curating or aggregating all of my videos, or not all of them, but say uh, 30 to 40 videos into a, like a beginner's course that I can just release on a day-to-day -day basis over say a 35 or 40 day period. Because a lot of people are asking some of the questions that are like like I said, some of the beginning stuff that we've already addressed, and I want, and I'm trying to find a way to help uh, take someone who has never started a company or LLC, and that that's interested in getting into this arena, help take them from A to Z, and then that way they could kind of catch up to where we're at, and then add value to our Facebook group. Because again, if we can bring everyone up to speed, then you know overall we will have a, a really strong group. And again, there's power in numbers. Then we'll be able to qualify for some of these uh, these large uh, bundled contract type awards. Um, Blah has a question. When filling out for supplier credit, can I use my Dunn's number up front instead of the requested Social Security number? Yeah, when you're doing supplier credit, uh, they're going to ask for Social Security number because you have to personally back everything. So yeah, you definitely need to... Uh, you're going to have to fill out your Social Security number, guys. So yeah, if anyone's doing supplier credit and you're a new business they're going to ask you for a social security number because even though your company is the one that's responsible for the credit, you have to personally guarantee it. And which makes sense because let's say, you know, you're a new company, they don't know who you are, they don't you don't have any history. So again, if you if they were if you didn't personally guarantee it, then you could essentially walk away from, you know, providing that supplier with the, the, the you know, paying them for the, 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 the materials or the tools or whatever that you receive from them. You could just walk away from it and keep the money. And that, so they have to have a way of, of covering themselves. But listen, don't let something like providing a social security number stand in your way because, again, the, the majority factor when determining supplier credit is not your your personal credit like i said in, in some of my past videos you know i've never had a personal credit score in excess of 670 so your, your personal credit is not the determining factor it's the actual trade references so if you've got really strong trade references they will overlook 
the majority of your personal credit because that's not what counts in this particular uh, in that business. It's it's trade references or the name of the game. Uh, Mr. Knowledge, you should do a drawing. Just saying hi. Hey, uh, explain uh, what the, what do you mean by drawing? Uh, two flame perfect. That's me. I want the course too. Yeah, right. And, and like I said, a lot of people are asking those questions, and so that's why I want to jump into that. So let's go ahead and um, let's go right in and dive into the first question of the day. And by the way, like I said, guys, this is interactive. So if you have any questions, please send me an, uh, an email or, like I said, send it here in the chat. We'll ask. So hi, Jolly. How often should I contact the contracting officer after an RFI has been issued? An RFI, um, there's, there's really no reason to contact the contracting officer. Uh, if they send out a request for information, they have you in the in their system. So, I mean, if they have you in their system, just make sure that you respond to any other solicitations that that person puts out. So what I would do is I would, uh, you know, tr follow that contracting officer and then whatever else they, information they put out, solicitations and stuff, just, you know, make sure you're always available to respond. <clears throat> Excuse me, guys. And then also, you know, if... If uh, if that contracting officer is on a particular a base or a federal facility, see if you can get access to that facility to try to set up a meeting uh, and, and talk with them, actually, about some of the stuff that's coming down the pipeline. Again, that comes with having a forecast list available. If you have a forecast list, then you know what they've got coming down the pipeline and would be a great reason to give them a call and ask for a meeting coming up. Blah. In responding to a sources sought solicitation, they're requesting documentation of distributor for name brand. What does that mean? Well, yeah, I mean, if they're requesting your distributor, then they want to know that you are going to meet the, okay, so if, if so just let me clear, like, explain the question for people. Uh, he's asking if you're responding to a source of side. So a source of side is when you go on FBO and they're looking for uh, small businesses who can meet the particular criteria. So in this particular instance, what Blah is asking is, it, when they're asking for that criteria, they're saying, documentation of the distributor for name brand and all that simply means is it's the government when they are putting out these particular projects and these RFPs and stuff like that they there's very few instances where they can specify a name brand so I have this remote next to me I'll give you an example so this remote is uh, says McQuay on it so they may say we want you to provide a McQuay remote or equivalent Right. So if you have if you have something that meets the requirements, you know, the color, the size, the the, the buttons has the ability to do everything else that the other remotes do, then uh, then you, they want to know who, who what other product that you're providing. And then they're going to probably want to know the specifications on it and to make sure that it does meet at least the minimum standards that they have outlined in that proposal. So that's what they're asking you for. All right. Can I list my P.O. box instead of my home address? Um, and do I attach my capability statement with the pre-solicitation source of request? I don't really understand what you mean. Can you list your PO box instead of home address? Um, if you're responding to a source of sought, you want, anytime you're responding to anything government-wise, make sure that all of your address information is consistent. So whatever you're using in FBO, I mean, or, or if you're registered in FBO, whatever you're using in FBO, whatever you're using in SAMS, just try to make sure it's consistent. I'll give you a really quick story. When I... A few years ago, when I was applying for my 8A certification, I, I mean, I, like I said, I, you, as you guys know, I've never had 8A, but when I was applying for my 8A certification, my SAM profile had one address, my uh, FBO profile had another address. When you go in and actually apply for your 8A, there's another um, website that you use, and that has that had another a third address for me, and then my taxes had a different address. And so I had all these address, and that was the very first thing when they when I turned in my application that they kick back was they go, you know, your address isn't consistent. The second thing that they kicked back on me was that my NAX code was inconsistent from what I had in SAM and what I had in my tax documentation. And, you know, that particular issue um, on the NAX code uh, was a really a, a big issue for me. Uh, and I'm, I'm glad you asked the question because that brings a really good point. When you start doing business, Again, make sure that you're consistent across all boards with your primary NAX code and also what you have in SAM profile. Because why? What happens? So when I was applying for 8A, the, they said, hey, listen, your NAX code doesn't match. And, and by the way, this is this what happened. So I respond back, and, I, and they, that was just one of the questions and comments. And so, you know, I went ahead 
and uh, I went ahead and changed the next code, right? So when I update the next code, they go, well, now um, that you've updated the next code, you now no longer uh, have the two years of history to apply for 8A, so you've got to show all these other documentation. And so for something so simple as having not placed the same next code in my taxes as I did on my SAM, the government now disqualified me from meeting the criteria. And I had been doing contracts for eight years. I literally had been doing contracts for eight years, same business. And they now said I wasn't in business because the next codes didn't match. So, so that's what I'm saying, ladies you know, gentlemen. To make sure that you're consistent across all boards, your address, uh, whether it's a P address or a home address, make sure you're just consistent. And then when you start filing taxes and you create your LLCs and you start doing business, you start even if you're getting paid as a consultant, just make sure that NAX code is the same NAX code that's in your tax papers. And it, on my uh, 1040, it's in the top left-hand corner on the 1040 uh, paperwork. Hey, Emmanuel, welcome to the group. Thanks for uh, joining us today. All right. Um, so that was, yeah. So just like I said, make sure everything's consistent. All right, guys. So let's see. The first question of today, just one question. My, many may companies from other countries, for example, Ukraine, take such contracts in the USA, but such companies use fed business ops and work with American companies in such a way. Yes, absolutely. I mean, the government does contracts all across the world, and there, uh, and a lot of American companies, they do joint ventures and, and team arrangements with companies from uh, other countries such as the Ukraine. So you definitely, uh, the companies from Ukraine, you can get con opportunities. In fact, uh, I was looking at a Maytok over in Peru just uh, probably a few weeks ago. And uh, they were specifically, you know, all the companies on there were companies that were based in that region of the country. That's in South America and Central America. So, you know, those all those companies that won those awards were based in that. And in fact, I have a, a video that I'm posting about a contract that we put together in Nigeria. And in order to be eligible for the contract, you had to have the you had to be certified business in Nigeria to, to qualify. I mean, so. You didn't have to physically be in Nigeria, but you had to have the you had to be a qualified Nigerian like business to, in order to actually even participate in that contract opportunity. All right. Question number two, uh, in regards to and this is more of a this is a comment in addition to a question. In regards to homework, I talked to some families currently in the government arena and worked with software developers. I inquired to see if they would be willing to go into business, but they want to go the 290 route, finish a project, go home, no real desire to expand their brand. Talked to another friend of mine who's a developer as well, currently wants to back out of the arena. However, I connected with a friend who's in the arena as well, but also has a home remodeling business. He's very interested in offering his service to the government. Um, we'll be meeting up in a couple of weeks to pitch a couple of ideas to him. Hopefully, I can come in as a consultant and help him land some contracts. Regarding GovCon course, it was wonderful. My mind, my eyes are now open to reality that I could become a millionaire. My company will have a piece of the pie. All right, and so, you know, a couple of things about this. The reason why I brought this up is... It shows that, you know, you can't stop at one person. You can't just give up when, when, you, when you're talking to one person. So, the re, you know, I, I, brought, I, I, I posted that to show that this, this individual went out and they spoke to multiple people about getting into this marketplace. You know, some people want to grow their business. Some people don't want to grow their business. Some people are interested. Others are not interested. So you can't just give up when you talk to one company, one brand. And, I, and Charles and I had uh, an extensive back and forth in that about you know the Tuesday before Thanksgiving when we discussed fear and failure we talked heavily about that you know and I gave an example of uh, Donald Trump being in a situation where he was uh, you know where he needed help some help and he talked to 10 10 people and five individuals were able to help him so you know the lesson in, in question number two was just don't stop because one person is not interested one person decides they want to help you there are there are hundreds and thousands of people out there that you can talk to uh, until you find the right company, the right firm to work with. All right. Um, how can I sell to the U.S. military on FedBiz Ops? Okay. Yeah. All those questions I've already answered. You can go back. Uh, take you know, sign up for my. If you're not in my in my uh, sign up already on my email list, my email list will direct you to my GovCon Giants course, and I have a video on selling uh, on FedBiz Ops. So, I've you know a lot of time we've already we've already produced a lot of that content out there. So just go back in my YouTube videos and watch some of that content. There are some SBLOs that are very friendly and spoke of advice. It's okay to ask them a reference to the active prime contract agency. Uh, I'm not sure what you mean by SBLOs. Um, I'm not I'm not, I'm not sure with that. But yeah, if you're talking about small business specialists, certainly, definitely, you know, if you're talking to uh, small business specialists in Austin Booz or you know the 
the, the, the Office of Small and Disadvantaged Business Utilization that helps you find a small business specialist, yeah, definitely ask them, um, you know, for references for prime contractors. They will be more than happy to share that information because, you know, the prime contractors want to stay in good favor with the government officers and the agencies. So, you know, yeah, definitely. I would, I would write, that would be one of the steps that I would tell you to do. If you're talking to people who are wanting to help you to, to break into that marketplace and to work with their agencies, definitely go and talk to them right away about uh, references for prime contractors. Great, uh, great, great idea. I'm registered. I need someone to help me big contracts. Yeah, uh, that's uh, right now. Yeah, that's not something that we offer. Hey, Javon, finally caught this live. Excellent. Thanks. Welcome. All right. Small business liaison officers. Yeah, right. Same thing. Small business officers, small business specialists. Yeah, same thing. Yeah, definitely ask them for uh, prime contractors that are that are doing your trade. I mean, if you if you know if you've gone through my course, that's one of the things that I suggest that people do is reach out to them. How much percent should I put on top for profit? A good rule of thumb. Also, would you like to direct solicitation? I received one yesterday. I emailed you about. Also, like. To... Okay, yeah, direct solicitations. So again, I'll put this out there for anyone. If the government has reached out to you with a direct solicitation, make sure you add me. Um, here, I'm going to write this. Take me and add me on Skype. Okay, and I will I will talk to anyone of you out there who has a direct solicitation. Can you see that? That's my Skype name. All right. So it's Evan Kauf, D E V. Add me on Skype, and anyone who the government has called you directly for a solicitation, who sent you an email, the government says they want you to bid something. Call me. I mean, send me a message on Skype, and I will I will make time to talk to you guys out there because when you get, when you receive a direct solicitation, that is uh, you know that's like the epitome of where you want to be at right now. You know, you're 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 put yourself in a position to where the government trusts you. Um, so, yeah, I don't blah. I don't. I mean, I've never seen an email from blah, and uh, so I, I'm really not sure what the name is under that. Um, some of his liaison officers. Da, 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 da. So, all right. Number three. I really appreciate your informative videos. I recently registered in Sam and I have my Duns and Cage. Now I need help. I called the Fed Biz Officer number. I spoke to an agent. He put my information in, and I got an upcoming contract from Library Commerce. He sent me the link, and I printed everything out. He mentioned about an agency called Simple Flight Acquisition Program that would help me fill out the application, but it would cost me over nineteen hundred dollars. I would appreciate your response to this matter. All right. Let's go back to this. It says that I spoke to an agent and fed this up, and they put their information in, and, and there's something for the Library of Commerce, and they printed everything out, and then they want you to pay $1,900. We discussed that um, in previous videos, guys. If people are asking you for money, then chances are they're not a government agency because government agencies and government entities don't ask you for money. They don't ask you to pay for anything. So, again, you know, if you are... Um, being asked for any kind of money or any type of payment for services, that is not a government agency because the government pays people to operate these agencies. They're already getting a check, so they're not asking for. They're going to ask for separate money from you, apart from their normal salary. So, so beware and be leery of companies out there trying to take advantage of you guys um, because they're everywhere. Uh, so, if anyone just keep that in mind, and I have a video on that, be careful of scams tricksters they're out there they're looking for you guys once you start getting registered in Febus Ops you'll receive a lot of emails where people are saying they can help you get contracts they can help you get started but the truth is no one can help you get you can't buy your way into this marketplace because if you could then none of us would have a chance because the wealthy people the rich people the rich companies would already have bought everything out and then there would be an opportunity for small businesses so just bear that in the back of your mind you know you can't buy yourself into this marketplace um, Attending events like GovCon events are expensive, $200. All of their agency officers there. Is it worth it? Have you been in for such events? Yeah, so, uh, so, so, how, Jalea, she asked me about going to different events. Definitely, again, if you guys have gone, if you're, if you're not in my GovCon Giants course, go through it. I talk about events. That's one of the ways that I, that you can actually get out there and start talking to agents and agencies. And it's well worth $200, definitely. So, yeah, that would be the only thing that I would agree to pay for. Is the two hundred dollars to 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 go to an event because an event um, is 
what happens when you go to a government again make sure it's a, a federal event all right make sure it's not don't just go to any type of event for government because it says government on it make sure the event that you choose is specific to the agency that you want to work with all right and make sure that that agency is you know applies to your next goal based on your market research so don't just go to events just for the sake of going to an event make sure that the event is applicable or is going to benefit you in some way capacity helping you to get your goal of working with that agency or doing business with that particular agency all right so you know just be careful about choosing your events i understand that you know i don't the 200 dollars i it's not really that bad it's more probably the travel expense of getting there because you know we've had to fly places and stay in hotels and there's specific hotels you got to stay in so it it can't get upwards of a thousand dollars but yeah we've benefited from events i actually learned about the hub zone program from an event we uh learned how the sub service stable program works from events I've met um, teaming partners from events. So, yeah, and, and I've also learned from experience sharing from other other small businesses at events as well. All right, so definitely events are, are a great thing. By the way, uh, blah, as, you know, again, like I said, I have, a, I have a video that I'm releasing that talks about pricing jobs, and I go through an example that I went through with one of my, uh, the people that are in my Facebook group, we went through an actual example with them. All right. Question number four. Thanks for all you do. My question does the contract winners have a government incentive to work with certified businesses trying to figure out why a winner would work with me over someone they've been doing business with for years? Right. All right. Now, why would a, a person who won a contract want to work with you? Um, no, they do not necessarily have an incentive to work with certified businesses. People will tell you that. Um, and yes, in theory, on paper, they do have an incentive to work with you. But unfortunately, um, you know, that's, again, that's on paper. That doesn't necessarily transfer to the real world situation. So, you know, when we're looking at the real world and, you know, doing things that apply to you and, and real world scenarios, the companies are going to choose you because you can provide a service. You can deliver upon a service. People, yeah, they may work with people that, you know, they say these people who have been business with for years. But did you ever stop to think that the people they've been doing business with for years, maybe that person's not fulfilling their needs. Maybe they've, maybe they're, maybe they're stuffed with work. Maybe they can't do it anymore. Uh, maybe that person's not delivering the same quality. Uh, you know, a lot of times businesses, they change staff, they change personnel. Maybe they like a, lost a key project manager. That happened with me. I mean, I worked on Fisher Island for two years. I worked on Fisher Island for two years down in Miami, Florida, and it was super lucrative, and I made a ton of money out there. But guess what? One of my, my key guy who was running the cruise and handling all my guys, he was in charge and making sure that we got the work done, and it was, and we, and we you know, because we're on Fisher Island, so Fisher Island, if you don't know, is a very exclusive place. Um, so if it's a very exclusive place in Miami, Oprah used to have a home there. And in fact, like I think their maintenance fees are like 10000 a month. So it's, it's a lot of wealthy people and you're working around people's properties and people, you know, they have expensive photos and pictures and journals and art and things like that. So, you know, my, my key project manager, um, that particular person, um, he got in some trouble and then he had something on his record and he could no longer get access to Fisher Island. So what happened was, you know, they were calling me for more work, but because my key guy was no longer available to go out there and work on the job site, I couldn't do it because I couldn't, I didn't have anyone else that I trusted to put out there to oversee the guys getting the jobs done. It was too valuable. Um, the, the, the risk was too great to risk, you know, people stealing out of these homes or people damaging people's art or things like that. You know, it was too great of a risk for me to entrust people without the proper supervision. So that's, you know, that's my particular situation. Um, but there's many reasons why someone want to work with you. Again, you know, when you when when these companies have all of these contracts out there, all of these opportunities, they're, you know, they may want you because you're local. They may want you because you have a relationship with the someone at the particular facility. There's a host of reasons. You can't think, well, why does this person want to work with me? Um, you have to go out and do it. You know, you have to sell yourself, right? Um, and then be available. Be persistent. Be consistent. So if you know, if you're not out there selling yourself and you're not presenting, your, you know, if they don't even know you exist, then then you, you've already lost the battle. So um, I would say that. Um, 
let's see what we have in here. Okay, hey, triple three. I've sent you an email. Don't know if you got my email. Been acting up. This guy from Dallas. Okay, um, I got an email from someone from Dallas. I don't know the name. Um, if you know, you could listen. There's many ways to reach out to me. Um, there's Facebook. Okay, you can respond to me on Facebook. You have my Skype. You respond to me on Skype. I get Facebook messengers. I get people email me and score contracts. I get emails. Um, you know, so you know, unfortunately. If you got, if you send me something, um, and I'm checking my stuff, you know, every day, every two days, I may not respond every few days because, as you guys know, um, hey, Shawnee, welcome. If you guys know, uh, you know, the channel is growing. That's why we're doing these live sessions so I can try and help answer questions live with people, and you know, the, you know, I'm making myself available to as many people as possible. Because before, like I said, I would answer questions, and then someone would, the next day would call me with the same question. The next day would call me with the same question. So it's easier for me to just to redirect people back to this, and we can reference it later on. And then that way, six months from now, you know, the new people coming on on board at that point, they're gonna have these same questions you guys have. I can direct them to this video to watch, and then that way they can, uh, you know, they'll have the information that's available. And I don't have to repeat myself because truthfully, uh, I know that. A lot of you guys out there are probably selfish and you're concerned about, you know, just what you're doing in your little world. But think about all the other people out here. Think about the people that are not where you're at. Think about the people who are starting or think about people who've gone past that level, right? So, again, we're trying to help uh, make this something for everybody, right? We want to make this uh, a, 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 an actual uh, an organization where we can help support as many small businesses as possible and that's my goal and that's why we're we're doing the, the live session now so we can kind of get some of the stuff out out of the way uh, but no i can't talk after this particular session I, like i said i'm here in puerto rico i'm already taking an hour away to work with you guys i got people out here waiting for me um, but i did want to make myself available because i have internet so no i can't talk today after the session but i will be back on thursday as well um let's see and as you relate to hell, small business are not responding to my emails or voicemails. I've tried multiple times with so escalation help, or can it backfire? Yeah, so, I mean, small business specialists is just one way to reach. Um, we, we'd have to talk. Send me an email about that, and I'll answer it offline. All right, we'll talk about that. Can I, okay. Uh, good reference fee, enough for your agency, duly know. Okay, yeah, that's true. Thanks, Lissandra. Yeah, I mean, I have my book on different agencies and references and all this stuff, if you guys uh, would pick up the book. Oh, yeah, the live stream is pro it might be buffering. Yeah, I do see, uh, I'm looking at it now. The, yeah, the health is not great here, but uh, I'm sorry, guys, about that. Unfortunately, I don't have a way of fixing it. In fact, I don't even see it now at, at all. I don't know if I'm on, what's going on. Hold on one second. So my OBS just went out. Um, blah, first of all, tell me what your name is. Because right now on YouTube it says Blah. And I don't know what that is. Alright. Can you guys hear me out there? Can someone let me know if they hear me? Because my... Uh, Um, because my, my OBS, which is a software that I use, is not showing. Oh, okay. All right, there it is. Okay, I got it back up. All right, great. All right, perfect. Okay, I got it back up. Good. Okay. All right, question number five. Um, good. Thanks, guys, for letting me know. Yeah, my, uh, the software that I use to stream live was down. So I couldn't I couldn't go to the next question. Perfect. Thanks, Chills. All right. Um, by the way, I see more people in the group watching. Say hi. Thanks, Johnny. All right. Greetings, Eric. Thanks for the intuitive and informative presentation. I certainly did enjoy it. In addition to getting some of the questions answered, the only issue I got at this point is how do I get in front of the actual representation that uses or in need of the services? All right. So, you know, some of these questions I, at this point, I bet you guys can start answering for people. How do you get in, in front of representatives? There's multiple ways. Uh, what I would say is go through the GovCon Giants course, and uh, I talk about different ways where you can get in front of people who need your services. Uh, I do have a video on uh, FPDS. You can use FPDS. 
that's a way to go out and find out who's buying what you sell. I have a video on that as well. So there's there's many ways that you can do it. We have already posted videos and that stuff, but I would say look at my FPDS video, look at my uh, my go through my GovCon Giants course, and also at the same time look at um, uh, on some of my previous videos on does the government buy what I sell. Number six. I do have a couple questions that I'm not really clear on. I understand that I'm moving towards getting in consulting arena start, so I'm doing the steps as if I'm going to be a prime contractor or a subcontractor. All right, so um, like I said, if, you, uh, if you're if you looking at becoming a prime contractor versus a subcontractor, I know the consulting video is coming out. It's not out yet, so I don't mind answering this question. So when you're going through the steps, if you're going to become a subcontractor, then you need to go through all the steps of getting registered in FBO and all, and and really, you don't even need a SAM registration unless you're going to be a prime contractor, because so as a subcontractor, the only reason that you would need to register um, in SAM or say FBO is if to get to speak, be able to speak to some of the small business specialists out there in the field they may want to pull up your information but to actually get contracts no one has ever asked me for my SAM registration to work as a subcontractor that's the short and simple answer so yeah again if you're looking at working as a subcontractor and you're let's say you have an existing business let's say let's say you want to help uh, your friend's family who has this huge concrete business or let's say let's you know because someone said I, I always give examples of construction so let's say you have a friend of the family I have this uh, pen here, right? This Sharpie. And let's say your friend makes Sharpies. His dad is the second largest Sharpie maker in America. So what you would do is, if you're interested in having him to, you know, to work and get contracts, if he's going to sell directly to the government, then he would be considered a prime contractor. In that case, he needs to go through all the steps and register in, Feb in, um, in SAM registration. But if he wanted to provide his services to another company who already had government contracts, then he doesn't have to do any of the actual registrations. He's already in business. You can go out and directly and start soliciting those people for work right away without ever doing any type of government registration because no one is going to ask you for that information. All right? Makes sense? Um, continuing on the same question, and this video mentioned that a prime should be registered in SAM, get it done, but the doesn't need to do this. If I should be doing this, no problem, but what about the capability statement? I don't have experience in construction, but want to be a consultant in the area. All right, so going back to the capability statement, if you are actually, um, so if you're going to be out helping someone else find contracts, then the capability statement that you want to carry around will be the one that represents the firm that you're going to be uh, representing in that sense. So if you're, let's say I'm, I am going to help provide, say, this pro McQuay uh, remote controls. My capability statement is going to represent the company McQuay on it. It's not going to represent Eric Coffee, you know, remote controls. It's going to represent McQuay remote controls because you're that, that's the firm that you're representing to help get contracts for. All right. I see a couple questions here in the chat. Um, you mentioned earlier there are approximately 700 plus IDIQ opportunities. Are there contracts all over the place, and where can you find them? Yes, there is. Uh, there is seven, about 700 plus IDIQs. Last time I checked, what I can do, I'm, I'll make that. I'll put that on my list of videos to do. I think I already have that on my list of videos I need to make. I will do a, uh, a specific video, a course, just on that course. But I'll do a specific video, like a training, on IDIQs, and I'll tell you where to find them because that's not. I don't have this. Just information popped in my head. That's why I actually wrote the book because I reference it myself. You, it's very difficult to remember all the websites that offer, you know, like where you need to go to find out these different items. And that's kind of what you know my book is about. And that's why I put the the Billion Dollar Playbook together, is to help you know again curate all this information um, and aggravate it so that you don't have to spend hundreds of hours trying to find out where do you go for that information. And in fact, what I will do. I don't even know if it's in the book, but if it's not, I'll make sure in the revised version of the book, I'll put it in there about those IDIQ opportunities. But those kind of websites change constantly, so it's a little hard to keep up with them. But I do have it somewhere, Jose. I'll, I'll make sure to find it, and we'll do a video on where to, those IDIQ opportunities, where they exist. Uh, there's a prime contract nearest my military base. It has backed a lot of IT contracts. However, no success in getting any response with them. Should I pursue it or use my energy for another company? Um... 
I would definitely pursue that prime contractor. You may be talking to the wrong person. Bear in mind, so the company that I work for um, currently right now, they have 10 project managers. And they're scattered around different job sites in the United States. So you may be just talking to the wrong guy. You may be talking to the project manager that's not responsible for that. Or you may not even be talking to a project manager at all. You, I mean, these, these people have hundreds of employees. So you've got to get to the right person um, to have the information, that, you know, to be able to, 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 to kind of help you decide where to go forward or not. It's quite possible that you're not talking to the right person. So I would keep uh, pursuing them. And, and in fact, what I would do in that particular case is I would go back. I would go to F, uh, FPDS, I would pull up the contract, and I would find out who was the contracting officer who awarded them that contract, and then I would call that contracting officer and ask them for the person who I should be speaking to from that particular prime contractor. That's what I would do if I want to get access to them. I would go backwards, and I would reverse engineer that. I would just call, I'd go back, pull up the contract, on their contract on FPDS, you can pull it up, find out uh, who's the contracting officer, call them and say, hey, look, you know, I saw this contract here. Who was the uh, point of contact for this particular contract? And then I would, and I would reach out to that person. Uh, Mr. Knowledge, no, I'm not in IT. All right. Good tip. Thank you, sir. All right. Uh, we've already answered that question number six. So moving on. Question number seven. Also, Eric, one of the things that many of us are interested in is I've talked to some of the Facebook members offline on the phone. How did you get into become, being a consultant and subcontractor in construction where you already – an expert in the market, I believe is what they meant to say. Were you already working construction? How did you know about the industry, Kevin? All right. Thanks. I'm glad you enjoyed that response. Well, that's, and that's why we have the, the YouTube Live, so we can kind of interact and I can help you uh, get some ideas about different ways to approach things. All right. So the question is, uh, how did I get into becoming a, a consultant and a subcontractor in construction really uh, quickly? Uh, so, no, I did not know anything about construction. I started out in real estate. And I was a realtor, and then when the, right before the market crashed, I didn't really like real estate. Uh, a friend of mine, or a friend of the family, was a builder developer. And so that person told me, hey, listen, if you get in construction, I can help you become a developer. And then essentially I said, okay, that's fine. He said, if, if you know, you're smart enough to pass the test and become licensed. So I did that. I passed the test. Um, and then at that point, I didn't know how to meet the licensing requirement. And so I had a friend of a friend. Because I had, I was, you know, I bought some real estate properties, and one of my friends said, "Hey, I, I know a guy that can help you, you know, get your your actual GC license. I know you qualified for it and you passed the test." And that person happened to be my first. Uh, that gentleman helped me out, <clears throat> and he's the one that introduced me to the world of Federal Arena. And so that particular person, he he told me about the Federal Arena. He didn't know much about it other than the fact that it was. Hold on one second. I have to cough. <clears throat> Sorry about that. Um, that person did not know anything. He knew that the, the possibility existed, kind of like I'm telling you guys, but he didn't know how to uh, tackle the, that marketplace. And we kind of learned together how, how to get into that marketplace. So he helped me to become a licensed contractor, and then I helped him to break into the, the federal arena, which he knew about. So I just started doing the work, learning about it. He, uh, because of his years in business and history, he already had a connection with someone at one of the military sites. So we were able that we were able to leverage that connection to get some of our first contracts, and then it just kind of snowballed from there. Um, were you already an ex, uh, expert in the market? No, I had no idea in the marketplace. And in fact, uh, so after working with, I worked with two partners as a consultant, and then when I decided to go out on my own, I wanted to get into a niche marketplace, and I knew nothing about it. And uh, I was just asking people who I worked with, hey, you know, I'm looking to, to do a, spe a, a specialty, right, in construction. And I ran to another friend of a friend who introduced me to steel buildings. And the guy literally vouched for me to help me get my supplier credit. He, This person said that he would use his expertise because he had done it for 30 years in steel buildings to qualify me to become a supplier for one of the largest manufacturers in the country. And he did that. So he, we leveraged his history. Um, and I had, you know, some money that I had saved up from working as a consultant. And so we leveraged his history to be, make me a, uh, get, to make me a, a, an official representative so that I could get discounted rates on that. And this guy actually literally, he bid all the projects for me right off the bat. And so the, the initial projects that I did in steel buildings, 
I had someone that was working for, in fact, he wasn't even my payroll. He, he worked as a percentage. So it didn't cost me anything to have the guy around. He just wanted to help somebody who was young and sharp and, and was excited about going to that marketplace. And this guy was already an expert. So you'll, I mean, you'll find a lot of that stuff out there. Um, I have a friend of mine who did, who built um, um, headphones. He built like those little headphones, uh, like those cheap ones that you sell at airports, the Yummy Buds and stuff like that. He built those, and he got his person to help him from um, Score, actually. Score, like my company, Score Contracts, but Score, which is the Service Corps of Retired Executives. In fact, let me write that down. If you've never heard of it. By the way, I do have this information in my book for you guys. Um, he he actually found his mentor by going to a SCORE meeting. So for you, if you guys don't know, it's called SCORE. And SCORE stands for Service Corps of Retired Executives. And that's a national organization. And uh, like I said, one of, of a friend of mine that was in my entrepreneurs group, he found his mentor in SCORE, and that mentor helped him land uh, exclusive deals with like distribution and help him actually when he was creating and develop because he actually made a product right he built headphones from scratch he made his own headphone and he he actually that person helped him with his distribution they helped introduce him to like airline manufacturers and things like that because this gentleman was already retired and he had worked in that marketplace in a long time and so he was the one that laid the foundation for those connections um, by the way Charles I see you in there you said you wish you had those connections uh, Everyone has the connections, but you're not reaching out to the people. You gotta, if you start talking to people about what you, your intentions are, you'll find out really easily. There's a lot, you know. Again, you know, six degrees of separation. We all know someone that knows someone else, someone else that we could end up. You're, you know, we're all six degrees from Donald Trump and and a Barack Obama. So, you, you know, if you guys start talking to people, you'll find out really uh, easily how. You know, you'll be surprised at where. Where who knows who that can help you out? That person may be, you know, you may you, you may think that a person's crazy or offbeat, but they may have a friend that's, you know, their chiropractor may be a solid, you know, or their phys or their therapist might be a solid. So you just gotta start talking to people and let them know this is your intentions and this is what you want to do, and you'd be very surprised at how many people. I mean, this guy who who gave me the reference, he was my AC mechanic. He was literally the guy that was putting AC in one of my rental properties. What would why would I think? that this guy would know someone who could help me teach me about government contracts. I had no idea. I just was talking to him. He goes, oh, you're trying to get in that marketplace? I got a buddy of mine, and he does that. I, you know, he, he's, he didn't listen to him because he's like, I don't do that stuff, but he, that's all he talks about. And he goes, oh, you want me to introduce you? I was like, yeah, sure, introduce me. And so that's kind of the, the theme, uh, guys. Just listen, you got to talk to people. If this, is, if this is your goal, this is what you want to do, and this is what your dream is, you know, you got to let, start letting people know so that they can help make you the introductions for you on that behalf. I mean, that's what I did. I mean, it's the same thing with me being in Puerto Rico. If I want to get contracts in Puerto Rico, I can't sit in my apartment and look in downtown Miami, look at South Beach and say, I want to work in Puerto Rico while having a margarita. you got to come down here, get dirty, and get down in Puerto Rico. you got to be on the ground with the people so that you can start making the relationships. And right away, I already started making the relationships. Um, Mr. Don 407, oh, which, oh, okay, you guys are asking questions inside. Um... The developer consult commercial residential. Um, I don't I don't I don't know what question you're asking. To be honest with you. All right, question number eight. Do you advise against us using home address business home address as a business physical address? I'm stuck in this dilemma. I saw while obtaining the expired Dunn's process for government contract that you couldn't use a virtual office address or a PO box address for a government Dunn's account. Please advise. Thanks, Shannon. Um, listen. I know a lot of people that use their home address as their physical address. In fact, uh, the same guy who introduced me to federal contracting for a long time, his home was his business. So we, and uh, I think up until maybe a few years ago, he was still using his home address as his business. I mean, because that's where he operated his business out of. And and in fact, uh, actually, I know Two, actually, both of the people I consulted with used used home address as their business physical address, uh, and I did that for a while in the beginning until I got me an actual office space. But no, using your home address is perfectly fine. We, I mean, in fact, we had the government agency, the 8A program, the representative. He would come to the home because we we actually didn't use that home for any other purposes other than a business. But he would come and visit us at the home and sit in there and give us the information. Um, 
So, yeah, that that's not a problem. Hey, Eric, if you're very informative, I had a quick question. I'm a Minneapolis realtor. And I was wondering if you could think it's possible for me to form a construction company and get contracts as a beginning subcontractor. Oh, absolutely. Listen, again, like I just told you guys, I started off as a realtor, and then I became licensed contractor, and I started getting contracts as a subcontractor. Um, so, yeah, it's possible. Anyone could do it. Sorry about the video if it's not streaming well. Again, I'm, I'm we're fortunate enough just to have internet here, so I'm not I'm I'm not even I'm gonna give thanks for the ability to even be present and have the opportunity to even talk to you guys tonight. So if it freezes up or it slows, I deeply I apologize for that. I hope that when it you know when it comes back up and it, it's recorded that it streams perfectly well. But you know I'm thankful to even just be here today with you guys uh, and talking to you, answering your questions. Um, question number nine, I know that you had an engineering degree and you got your first big contract. I'm trying to think bigger like you stay in your videos. Okay, so I just answered that question. Uh, number 10, good day, Eric. I'm looking for the information on what next codes I should use for small businesses. Right now, I'm looking to drop goods, cleaning supplies. Since my company is relatively new, any advice or suggestions, that would be great. Thanks, Sean. Um, so what NAC code, NACS codes you should use? Again, guys, uh, you know, I hate to say it like a record book, but if you go through my course at the day 12, I talk to you about how do you get started, where you're going, and so if you're, you know, if you're out there and you're not sure about NAX codes, you got to find a, a marketplace where you can actually act as a consultant and work with and help someone get contracts, or maybe someone in your family is already doing certain kind of contracts, focus on those NAX codes. Um, so you know, like I said, uh, I would. When you know, go back and look at areas where you have some sort of expertise. I'm not expertise, but areas where you have an advantage um, over someone else, and that's the areas I would focus on. I would, I, I look to see where I, I can get an advantage over someone else, or I can leverage someone else's already advantage. So if I know someone that's already doing twenty or thirty million dollars in a private sector, man, I would be working on trying to, to trying to leverage that person's business and help them get government contracts because if they're that successful in the private sector, that will easily translate. Um, to success in the government marketplace. It would make it easier for you, make it easier for them, and, and you'll look like a hero at the end of the day. Um, so, yeah, guys, I'm, by the way, I'm going to be in Puerto Rico until Monday, so it's, it's highly unlikely I'll be able to talk with anyone between now and Monday, so don't, um, unfortunately, that's just the case. Good afternoon, Eric. My, I hope this email finds you in good health. I'm a small business owner currently working as a sub in healthcare industry, providing computer services to my client. In the near future, my goal is to be a prime contract to government agencies, I've completed my entity registration with Sam, but I have not submitted it. Is it possible? Or do you provide consulting services to review Sam's account before submittal? I viewed your YouTube videos; they're helpful, but still need someone to review before I submit it. Your help would be greatly appreciated. Sincerely yours, Noel. All right, I do not provide Sam registration services, uh, nor do I advise you to use Sam registration services. You know, unless you have more money than time. But if you if you don't have more money than time, I really recommend that you go through the process and attempt to do it. Even if you're not successful in registering with Sam, you you know once you attempt to do the registration, you you actually they have a one eight hundred number that you can call. That there's no issue with actually uh, them helping you to fill out your Sam registration. In fact, if you look at the video on the college students that won their first contract. That's what they used to finish up their Sam registration. They had an issue with it. They picked up the one eight hundred number, and someone actually called. And help them right away. So there's no reason to use a third-party registration site. I would just go through and try it myself because, if you know, think about it this way. Uh, again, unless you are already, you have a lot of more money than time. This is the very beginning stages of getting started in this arena, and so you you know you got to be able to get past some of this stuff. Uh, you know, Sam registration. If you can't figure out, you know, hire your daughter, hire your son, hire you know, hire a high school kid, hire a grandchild. You know, hire someone that's between the ages of you know, 14 and 25 years old, put them on my videos and let them go through and do your registration place. It's, it's really, um, I don't want to be demeaning about it, but it's, it's something that, you know, any, you know, college kid or high school kid nowadays can do because they're, they're, they work in and out of the computers. And let me tell you, I can't use Snapchat, but I can do Sam registration. And these kids all use Snapchat every day of the week. Question number 12. <laughs> Um, I was following my articles of organization, but I want to ask if you're following an SC or LLC for government contracts makes a difference in awarding your contract or not. Any info regarding the process is greatly appreciated. Warmest regard, Shunja. All right. Um, so, you know, if you are subscribed to my, if you're my, you know, subscribers email list, I do have a, an article about that. In fact, what I'll do, I will make it available. I'm going to put it on my blog as well. I'll put that same article regarding my blog. I recommend LLC because LLC 
and I have to, I have nine reasons for it. But the LLC is one of the easiest, um, or you know, entities to create, and also it allows you to have you know foreign ownership. It allows you to you can actually file uh, different for taxation purposes than the actual corporation. It, pro it, pro it protects you against lawsuits, and a lot of the these big companies that I work for, they all have LLCs. So. LLC, I would recommend just start with an LLC, but you know, especially for people getting started, that would be the way to go in my uh, for me. So I'm going to talk offline about your question. All right, uh, I'll send you something about about that because we we still got to get your story on tape before we go into that. All right, so we, we'll 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 make a session for that. Hey Eric, how do I find? And by the way, this is question number fourteen. Eric, how do we, how are you doing? How, sorry. How do you go about finding companies that have 8A certification or HubZone or DBE, et cetera, Hector? Okay, so when we're looking at, by the way, this should be question 13, not 14. When we're looking at, um, you're trying to find 8A certification or HubZone or DBE, you want to go to DSBS, um, Dynamic Small Business Search website. I don't have it in front of me, but you want to use what's called Dynamic Small Business Search website. I do have it on the, in my book, and where else do I have it at in place? Um, let me write it down for you guys. I don't know the website by hand because, like I said, I'm traveling. But I will write down the acronym and what it stands for. And you guys can figure it out. Because it's not a straightforward website. All right. That's it. DSBS, Dynamic Small Business Search. All right, so go there, go to DSBS, and that will give you, um, a, that will show you where who's all the you know all the certified firms are. You can you can search for them by then. All right. By the way, I just want to make sure I see a lot of people asking questions about small business programs. Make sure you sign up for a small business mastery webinar. I haven't released it yet, but again, it's going to be based on the amount of people signed up. I think right now we've got about 20 or so people signed up already. Uh, it's still in beta phase. I'm still testing it out, and I would love for anyone interested in any of those certifications. I would love it if you guys um, would sign up for that. All right, so sign up for that. Hey guys. All right, looks like it's at 8:02. So what I'm going to do? I want to thank everyone uh, for coming out today. I'm going to go ahead and wrap it up. Like I said, I'm here, and uh, everyone's waiting for me. They've been very patient and kind. There's about 15 people out there waiting for me right now. So we're going to wrap up today's session. I thank you guys. I will be back on Thursday. And uh, so if you have any questions, make sure you send me an email. Send me uh, your information. Uh, if you've got any solicitations, hit me up on Skype. Uh, you have my information. All right, guys. Listen, thanks for joining me today. As always, sign up for uh, GovCon Club. Sign up for my webinar. On the Small Business Mastery, it's on my – if you go to my resources page, I'll pull it right back up. It's right there under scorecontracts.com forward slash resources, and you can see right there the Small Business Mastery Program. All right, guys. Uh, thanks. Everything is going well in Puerto Rico. Uh, yeah, well, so it's a good question. We, we are at a uh, church here. Uh, it's one of our sister churches, and so they have lights. They have water and everything like that, but the, the pastor and their families do not, nor do the people in the surrounding area. So we were fortunate enough that this facility – uh, they were get provided power, and so we we're out, go, you know, going out and put tarps and roofs and cutting down trees and things like that. So, in fact, we ran into some of the female people today, and we ran into some people out in the field, and they, we thanked them for what they were doing, and they thanked us for what we we're doing. All right, all right, guys, thanks so much. We'll talk to you soon.